Okay, hi everyone. Um, I'm here today with Tanya Jenka, um, founder of um, We Hack Purple. Um, we Hack Purple is actually a member benefit and you are more than welcome to find out about that when you join as a member. Um, I really do thank Tanya for her contributions because it's tremendous the work that she's been doing for the community. Um, as many of you know, she won two WASPI awards this year, which is I think the first time ever. Um, we might even have to change the rules to prevent that happening again. <laughs> but that's okay, because for once, it's actually really deserved for both the, uh, I believe it's the educator, or what was the other category, Tanya? I think it was community cheerleader. Or community yeah. Ex excitedness. Absolutely. And again, um, a worthy, worthy recipient, because on every Monday you do the mentoring program, uh, you know, find a mentor, which is absolutely what we need in this industry. So worthy, worthy recipient. Uh, so Tanya, um, tell us a bit about yourself and, uh, you know, what are the problems you see in the industry as you see it today? So uh, I am a giant nerd on the internet. <laughs> it's hard to describe what my job is. So I technically run a training company and then we have this big community. And I, then I also like go in and train companies, but mostly I am about trying to share knowledge in regard to how we can make software more secure. So I was a dev forever and then I switched into security and got kind of, I didn't realize that there was this whole giant community that I could join. And honestly, I joined OWASP immediately and then was just invited into mm -hmm. like a project, into a chapter, to events. Like it just, it, like my whole career really blossomed as a result of becoming part of the OWASP community. And um, what do I see in the industry? Uh, problems or challenges, like things I'd like us to work on. I, I would love for us to work on finding a more standardized way to create secure software. I would love mm -hmm. it if we shared more information. So OWASP is awesome at that. Um, but, you know, generally industry, like private companies, we tend to keep that all a secret. And I yep. agree that we can't just give our intellectual property away all the time, but can we give some? Yeah. Right? And, and I would also like, I hope one day to see that some of the tooling prices go down a bit because security tools versus dev tools, it's just astronomically more money, right? And if you're a dev and your budget is like this, it's yep. unlikely you're going to be able to afford to buy security tools you would like. Mm -hmm. And that means that they're less interested in them. But I wish that developers were like, give me all the security tools. <laughs> this. Yeah. Absolutely. And in fact, that's one of the areas that I think OWASP has a uh, role is to provide, you know, world-class tools, but some of it's all tied up in software patents. And that's one of the reasons why the um, source code um, static analysis is in such a parlous state. Um, some of the most fundamental things about compiler theory are patented, even though they are compiler theory from the 1950s. There should have been no patents granted for source code and static analysis at all. And we might have actually seen some actual competition to get some reasonable pricing. Oh, that, I didn't know that. When I was in college, I actually had to build my own compiler. It was hard. Yep. Absolutely. <laughs> Do you have um, the Bible? Are you going to show me the Bible with the dragon on it? Oh, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. It's I, I a fantastic book. <laughs> but everything in here is well known, but if you apply it to static code analysis, you're going to fall afoul of uh, software patents, and that's ridiculous. Yeah, that's totally ridiculous that you... Uh, well, I mean, maybe one day we can fight it, or maybe that patent will expire, because don't patents expire after a certain period of time? Um. Do you know what? It's been a while since I've actually looked at the patents involved in here. They should have expired because uh, they should have only been lasting 17 years. And the ones that sort of helped found the original work uh, were like 2003. So they should be coming up for being expired. But the US system has a lot of submarine patents. You can keep patents alive by mucking around at the edges and still be... You may lose the original, but now you've got this other thing that's extremely derivative of the original patent, and the submarine patent then takes over 
Um, it wouldn't surprise me. Wow. Uh, but we need to, it's really disappointing because the focus in the past on tools was always for security staff to use it, whereas we need developer staff, um, developers to use these tools. And to do that, I don't know about you, but they need to have very few false positives. And I think the current situation with software patents is holding back that market. Yeah. Oh, it certainly sounds like it. That's for sure. And another part of the market that frustrates me is, or I mean, I'm benefiting from it because I run a training company, but the training's so expensive. It's so expensive. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, Andrew. And mm -hmm. when we go to college or university, like, so I went to college in the 90s. <laughs> So that was a while ago, but when people go to college and university now, there's still a, a lot of places that are teaching waterfall still. And I don't think that we should not teach it at all. I think we should teach it as history. Yeah. What used to happen. <laughs> but they teach like nothing about security. The only thing they'll teach mm -hmm. is maybe identity and access management, which is quite important. And they'll teach the concepts maybe of authentication and authorization. And then they're like, there, you know, I'm like, no, they don't know enough. Yeah. That's so that's the, why we're actually, we <laughs> absolutely, we absolutely do need to also bring the uh, security industry along for the ride as well. Um, a lot of the stuff that we see is wagile because they still have stage gates and stage gates are nemesis number one to developers. It's like, how can I avoid doing this stage gate? I've got to avoid it. And I know. <laughs> I know. I do consulting, um, and all the time they'll be like, "Oh yeah, every single one of our pipelines has the SAST product, and you can't go, cannot collect two hundred dollars unless you pass it." And then I go and I look, and it's been disabled by all the devs because they have work to do, and it's full of false positives, and no way, Jose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's one of the problems with, as I said before, the static code analysis tools are designed for people who've got skills to be able to say that's a that's not an issue. Look away from there. Um, you know, I once did a static code analysis and it had zero problems. And I just looked at it; it was full of suppression. Like they suppressed every error that was causing them problems. And I just go, this is not really helpful, guys. <laughs> like 400 suppression rules you're like okay so let's talk <laughs> yeah, pretty much that was fantastic okay so um looking forward um what would you like to see change in our industry like um obviously you're pushing for change we have purple um and you've got these courses that are available online um how do you think developers can learn better developer awareness what would be the single change you would like to see most development teams take on board um, hmm, that's really tough. So there's, there's sort of two things that I, I hope to see. One is that there's a secure system development life cycle. And by that, I mean, so whether you're doing DevOps or agile, whatever you're doing, but there are certain steps that you have to do that are security and not like a gate, but like you have to do this at some point. So for instance, threat modeling or, you know, Every time we check in code, someone more senior does a secure code review on that bit that you checked in. They just check it out yeah. and if there's any obvious things, they stop you and that's it. And so if there could just be like a couple things that for sure happen for every app before it goes to prod, that mm -hmm. would make a huge difference. And then the other aspect of that is, is just training developers. and. I know I run a training company, but you can train them yourself. That's how I started giving training was I was doing AppSec and I needed the devs to stop doing bad things. And I'd never done talks before. And mm -hmm. I, so Andrew, you've seen me speak all over the place, but my first talk, my heart was beating so loud. I was actually quite certain that you could hear it in the whole building. And I was like, I'm gonna die. And they're like, you, it's literally impossible. I'm like, no. I'm an overachiever, I'm gonna die. And they're like, you're gonna be fine. And it was actually my old dev team and I'd switched to security. So they're literally my friends. They're yep. totally like cheering for me. And they're like, you looked like you were gonna die. <laughs> <laughs> I must admit. I... It was fine and I didn't die. 
One of the things I really want to do is actually institute a program to help the um, presenters present better. I did an OSCon in 2010. Uh, this is an open source conference. It was fantastic. It's a really good conference if you ever go, um, want to go. Uh, they hold it in Portland, I believe. Um, the, they actually help their presenters get over these butterflies and actually how to present well. Um, like, like how many slides can you get through in a realistic time frame? Um, and they workshopped their uh, slides and things. I think it's a really good thing to actually bring up um, the skill levels of presenters. But my number one piece of advice for presenters, practice. Practice in front of people. Mm -hmm. Like I, oh my gosh, when I first started presenting, Andrew, first of all, I spoke at every single meetup in all of Ottawa, the city I lived mm -hmm. in at the time. Like I was like, hi, JavaScript meetup. And they're like, hello. I'm like, hi, do you want to see a talk about how to hack your own apps? And they're like, okay. And then I was like, Python meetup, hi. <laughs> because when you write a security talk, most of the time you can actually shop it around to like a lot of the dev ones are like sort of, and there's so many meetups. Yeah. And I know right yeah. now other humans are dangerous and we're not supposed to go near them, blah, blah, blah. But now you can apply online everywhere. It's awesome. You can speak at a meetup that's in India, even if you're in Canada like I am. I'm actually appearing at OS London, um, I believe, in a couple of days' time. And that's one of the benefits of um, doing um, virtual stuff. And I think we should still do it after this is all over. But um, um, one of the things that... Um, you know, I, I don't really want to concentrate on the women in AppSec and things because, quite frankly, you're a practitioner and everyone should have that opportunity. Um, but are there any issues that OWAS could improve in this area that you feel like we could do a better job? So your merch store could have <laughs> ladies' clothing, not just unisex, i.e. men's clothing. That's mm -hmm. one thing. Um, I feel like... Uh, I don't really like, did, do you have the women in AppSec group now or is it now oh, yes. diversity in AppSec? Because I thought they were changing it somehow. Um, I asked them to do diversity, inclusion and women in AppSec. Um, they were just women in AppSec and I think many of the same topics uh, for underrepresented and underserved groups are um, the challenges that are faced by women are also faced by people in places like Africa or India. Um, but also people trying to get into the industry, but also people at the tail end of their careers. Uh, it can be very hard for people in their 50s to get a job. Um, so we want to we want to combat a lot of different types of inclusion um, issues. And so I did ask them to become the diversity, inclusion and women in AppSec. Um, but I think they're still very focused on the women in AppSec side of things. So if you want to get involved, I'm but the reality is it's a bigger topic than I think than just women in AppSec. Yeah, no, I, I agree 100%. 100%, Andrew. Um, so one of the things that we Hack Purple has done, so we have a community and we have a really strict code of conduct and you have to like agree to it when you come in. Mm -hmm. But if someone's bad, we throw them the F out. Like, bye, <laughs> you used a racial slur, never come back. <laughs> like, yeah. or you were sending inappropriate messages to a bunch of people like, no, 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 no. And yep. being really strict with the code of conduct really helps. We also have a diversity scholarship. So mm -hmm. people apply and tell us why they are a member of underrepresented people in tech. And sometimes yep. the answers are, are very interesting. So for instance, if you're a man who lives in India, you're not underrepresented in your yeah. area because First of all, like India is awesome with like a zillion amazing tech professionals and they have almost gender parity. However, yes. because of the currency um, exchange, then they become underrepresented in being able to get training. Does that mm. make sense? So yeah. like we let them kind of explain to us and as long as their reason is because I wanna, like if they have a real reason, then they mm -hmm. get put on our list. And then um, we have businesses that have been sponsoring people. So if some a business pays for one person, we match them with two other sponsorships. And then we put three people through. I think we put 70 people through and something like 60 of them are women of color, which is really yep. awesome. 
and then we introduce them for jobs. And so whenever a company's like, we take diversity seriously, I'm like, want to meet some grads? Yep. <laughs> and then sometimes they hire them. That's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. That's the sort of impact that we really need to do. And that's one of the reasons why I love the work that you do with mentoring as well. Um, I must admit, I, I tried mentoring for a bit and I am terrible at making um, repeat appointments. And therefore I'm a terrible mentor because I'm not always there for the people when they need it. Um, but fundamentally, finding and connecting people um, to improve skill sets in our industry is one of the ways that we get through the skills shortage that really is throughout our industry, I think. Yeah. Um, for people that aren't aware, every Monday on Twitter, I do this thing called Cyber Mentoring Monday. And so it's hashtag all one word Cyber Mentoring Monday. And it's not just me anymore, Andrew. There's like 20 of us. It's so awesome. There may even be 30. Like, there's so many different people that use it now. There's some people that have like regular streams mm. uh, to try to help mentor people. And so every week there'll be a new person I've never heard of before that's like, hey, I've got 20 years experience in this. Mm. Who wants to learn about this? And then they have, you know, virtual coffees with people. They talk to people. And then often they end up kind of pairing off. And, um, I was at a conference right before the pandemic when all scariness happened and this man walked up to me and he's like hey may i buy you a coffee i'm like well i have a coffee but do you want to have your own coffee with me while i drink this one and he's like yes and he's like i need to thank you and i'm like okay great and he's like i did the cyber mentoring monday thing and i offered to mentor someone and i met this lady who had like just graduated computer science and I mentored her for six months. And then my company actually had a position open and I hired her and now she's worked for me for a year and she's amazing. And I would never have found her without this. And he's like, I just wanted to say thank you. And I was like, oh my gosh, you're welcome. That's amazing. And so people share stories like this with me all the time. And I, oh, yeah, it feels pretty it's good. It's really good. <laughs> well, that changes lives. And that's the sort of impact that I'm really looking for. Um, a lot of the time, OWASP, we did a lot of conferences and things. We did a lot of meetings, but nothing really changed. And so when I took over the OWASP Top 10, I wanted to make sure that things moved on the OWASP Top 10. Having SQL injection at the top all the time, not great. So I'm glad it's moved. And that's exactly what mentoring can do. It can really move the needle for people. Oh, yeah, for sure. Well, and those connections that you make. So I mm -hmm. have professional mentors that I call when something happens and I ask for advice and mm -hmm. I might not talk to them for six months or something. And then I'm like, whoa, this thing happened. I need some advice. And yeah. uh, having that person you can trust that really has your best interests at heart is a big deal. Yeah, I sort of sometimes steering a nonprofit through the muddy waters I obviously don't have a business background, but I'm doing the best I can, but I think maybe I needed a, a mentor in that area myself, so. <laughs> you should use Cyber Mentoring Monday. You could find one, for real. Okay, I'll, okay, I'll definitely reach out next Monday and I'll find out what's happening. Okay, um, any last words or uh, shall we? Everyone join OWASP, become a member, make friends, meet people, have fun. Absolutely. Do you know we're about we're about to hit five thousand members for the first time. Yes, <laughs> that, that's a, like a fifty six percent increase in our membership since I started, which is amazing. It's amazing what happens when you get back to the community. Um, and just like you, my career has grown tremendously because of OWASP. So definitely, please join. That's fantastic. And again, Tanya, thank you so much. And as I said, your Jewel Waspies, first time ever, but worth it. Thank you so much for being a part of our community. Thank you for having me. And thank you for the word, everyone. No worries. Okay. I'll uh, pause there.